I, I'm just going to start off with just sharing this testimony that I haven't shared about our missions trip that we've just gotten back from, from Honduras. Um, this particular uh, instance, we were doing one-on-one -on -one ministry going into what they would call a home. It's not something that we would call a home. And as we walked in, this grandma had a heart problem. And specifically when we walked in, she had a heart that was just really racing, beating uh, faster than what it should be. So as we begin to pray for her, instantly God just began to move, uh, tears coming down her cheek as she began to let us know through the interpreter that her heartbeat had stabilized and was no longer beating the way that it was with her heartbeat being way out of control. And she just had these tears coming down her cheek. And so we love watching the expressions of when God just ministers to people. It's so beautiful, so incredible. Is that good news or what? You guys have to do a little better than that this morning. I'll go. We've got a rule around here if you're visiting. I just want to know. I know there's some family members that maybe, if you, if you want me to preach faster, then you've got to amen better. So if you're quiet, I will be long-winded. Long, I, I, we, can, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. How do you want it? All right. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. So I said, this woman got healed in her heart. It was incredible. Right there. On the, that's standing up even. All right. So, so this is incredible. Um, so as we go now, she's been healed. We're leading her to surrender her heart to Jesus and pray with her. And um, she wasn't praying with us, but we knew that she was just touched by God. You know, we don't, we're asking her if that's something that she wants. She wants to but she was not able uh, to pray. And so in my mind, the first impression was, you know, sometimes people believe the, the terrible lie of the enemy. I'm not good enough. I don't deserve his love. All these type of things. One thing I thought was beautiful is her grandma. And we asked her, have you ever surrendered your heart to Jesus before? And she said no. And I love that. I'm like, this is incredible. Uh, these are those divine moments, you know, that God has just set up. So we're sitting here and we're trying to, you know, you don't know as an interpreter what's going on, uh, problem with the interpretation, but nothing's going on. The interpreter then obviously let us know where she was from was a major area of witchcraft in that, in that community that we were at. Then we began to realize what we were dealing with. We began to lose heaven and, and lose the very thing that was holding her back from literally surrendering her heart. Um, but in a moment, she was loose. She began to pray. She surrendered her heart to Jesus, gave her life to Jesus right there, got healed and gave her life to Jesus. And it was incredible, and it's beautiful. And the reason why I'm bringing this, starting off with this testimony, because I'm actually wanting to deal with some aspects of spiritual warfare here this morning, and a little bit differently maybe uh, than maybe we have in the past. And so, you know, that, that is one of those supernatural moments, obviously, um, the, dealing with spiritual warfare right there. Um, and that was... Overseas, third world country, but I, I will tell you, I have some other testimonies that make that one look like a picnic, and it wasn't in a third world country overseas. I'm talking about right here in Madison County. And, and, and I, got, I got to tell you, the ones that are harder isn't the witchcraft overseas. The harder uh, demons you have to deal with are with the religious demons that like to show up and some of the most faithful attenders to churches every Sunday, and that's the religious de spirits that... That, that like to creep their head in. And um, so, but in, in the spiritual warfare and dealing with it, um, they're, they're, we've, it's, it's not like we've never heard about spiritual warfare before, at, and it's quite opposite. Uh, I'm sure you have, but um, Paul goes into some definition in spiritual warfare, probably gives us some of the greatest revelation. Um, he, he even, you know, there's even some times where he says, I have, don't want you to be ignorant about this. I, I, I don't want you to not know. I don't want you to, to, to say you didn't know. I want you to have some understanding in this area. Ephesians chapter 6 is one of those places dealing with, uh, I'm going to begin in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness and high places. Wherefore, take on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. 
stand therefore. And he begins to go into the pieces of the armor. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that as a result of your word that our lives will be changed. God, open up our ears to hear your voice uh, beyond uh, through 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 your word. We just thank you for lives being changed. I thank you for freedom here this morning. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Now, dealing with spiritual warfare, that was one of those supernatural experiences that you hear about from time to time. Uh, and, and I'm going to deal with, with it a complete opposite from where that story really kind of began. Um, because the reality is, uh, the enemy usually is, is, when you look throughout Scripture, you're going to find out in dealing with that he's subtle. matter of fact, you can find uh, specifically in Revelations chapter 12, uh, in verses 10 and 11. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be, I, there's going to be a lot of people that may say this, but I've got to be one of those ones on this day in eternity. I'm going to be so happy and so thrilled. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which is accused them before God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Um, this is when he's being cast down, and, and, and I'm going to be ecstatic, I, and, and, and I might have to repent. I don't think I'm going to have to, but I am going to tell you, you're going to find my shoe or my butt kicking him on his way down is all I got to say. I'm going to be pushing to the front of the line, and I'm going to be just, I'm going to be grinning. I'm going to be grinning from ear to ear. And I don't know how Christian that is, but I have to admit, I know that's how I'm going to be on that day. And so... Um, we see, though, that he is literally called the accuser of the brethren as one of the many titles that he's been given. Um, Satan, actually in the Hebrew, means accuser or adversary. The word devil in the Greek, because these are all the words we hear so often, Satan, the devil. Um, but, but devil in the Greek means slanderer. You know, I don't know what your idea of or your image or picture is, but in the Hebrew, it means accuser and adversary, and in the Greek, it means slanderer. And um, so, uh, just, just to give one, one of the things in Revelations there that it said, let, let, let's read that again. Um, For the accuser of brethren is cast down, which has accused them before God once in a while. That, that annually, once a year, he'd go before, no. Now, one thing the scripture is pretty clear on, this isn't just once in a while. This kind of covers it pretty whole, doesn't it? Day and night. Day and night. Now, that doesn't sound like a rah-rah scripture for me to be. Uh, de- I came to tell you this morning, the enemy is after you day and night. Hallelujah. I mean, but that's the reality, you know, and, and this, is not a, this is a war that we are in, whether you realized it or not, uh, when taking that breath you've drafted into this war, this battle, and it's good to be prepared for it. And the reason why I mean is because so often when we're thinking of spiritual warfare, we're thinking of the right type of prayers, the louder that we shout the different protocols of the name of Jesus. And depending on how long you've been around being raised in church, there's been the evolution of deliverance from uh, bringing out the trash can and people coming around and, you know, doing deliverance in different ways, different styles, different methods of deliverance. Um, and, and, and so it just, it just really depends. There's different personalities, different ways of ministries have of of doing deliverance, but I don't, I'm not even talking about that or necessarily even dealing with that. What I'm dealing with here is us to go into the Word of God and let's picture. Now, God is omnipresent, but the devil's not, right? Uh, he can't be everywhere at once. And so I know some days, some weeks, you maybe feel like you've been wrestling with the devil, but it's probably quite the contrary. Not that your week's not important, but maybe he's dealing with something a little bit different priority in that moment, I don't know, um, but but 
so whether you're dealing with a, a demon, an imp, uh, dealing with uh, uh, curses, dealing with all these type of things, um, when I look into Scripture, though, and I do see where the devil did have his showdowns, we can find out in Scripture, obviously, when Jesus has gone in uh, to the wilderness. Now, that he had just been baptized. We just had a baptismal service. We love him. Jesus was baptized. He comes up out of the waters. The Spirit of God descends upon him like a dove. The heavens open up, and there comes a voice audibly that you could hear that says, This is my beloved Son, and whom I'm well pleased. Talk about an incredible, we all love, live for these type of divine moments. Shower down on me, Spirit of the living God. Let heaven's voice ring out about I am a son or you are a daughter of the Most High God. And we can see that it says that the Spirit of the Lord led him into the wilderness. And if you've ever had these encounters with God, you know it's incredible. You know it's awesome. You know if you've needed catchers in a service, carried out of a service, not for deliverance, but carried out because you were so touched by God you couldn't walk out. You understand what I'm saying? You, we've had these moments where, where this is incredible times. And, and so you know, here's Jesus being led, and you're just like, this is incredible. I'm awesome. Let's go to the mountain. Let's go to the mountain to pray. We're going to Mount Zion. I mean, we can throw in some pretty powerful prophetic uh, terminology in this moment. But the reality is, here he is. He's being led by the Spirit of God. And I don't know if he realized everything that was getting ready to happen, but he's seeking God. And on this mountaintop, I don't see him having an encounter with God as much as we see he's having an encounter with the enemy. So don't feel it too strange if you're seeking God with all of your heart and you're like, what is going on here, God? I, I'm reading the Bible, but I feel like as if it's something that I feel worse about myself as I'm reading. What's going on here? You, you've just left a powerful service. You've left church. You've had Kleenexes because God's touched your life. And you get in a fight in the car before you get uh, out of the church parking lot or driving over something like we always say, something so profound and powerful is where we're going to eat. You know, it's like amazing, right? We've been touched for eternally. Never be changed. We're on our knees. Lord, I surrender all until I get in the car and fight with my spouse or, or my kids, right? It's like, what is going on here? We find that this is actually, the devil didn't send somebody on his behalf. He, he actually came himself, and he's going to throw everything hell has to throw at Jesus before he ever opens up a blind eye, before he ever heals a leper, before he ever walks on water, this is the enemy's moment. If he's going to do it now, this is that moment. And this is another thing. The, the enemy didn't come at him when he came out still dripping from the waters of the Jordan River. He didn't come after him when, when he's feeling the anointing and still hearing the echoing of the voice of God in his ears. The enemy comes after him after he hadn't eaten for 40 days. Why? Because he knows our weaknesses. He knows our weaknesses. And like we shared, we've already joked about a little bit, it's not like you need a spiritual special uh, discerning of spirits to know our weaknesses. Just ask your spouse or your children, and you can find out what your weaknesses are. You'll find that when you watch your children, they know how to push each other's buttons. If you, if you have more than one child, you'll understand this. They know how to aggravate each other to just the point to where they can stop and get the other one in trouble, and they didn't do a thing. <laughs> um, and multiple verses of Scripture speaks about familiar spirits. You know why? Because they're familiar. Why? They know. That's why you can go to a fortune teller, and they're freaked out going, oh, my gosh, they said something about you. Yeah, it's a familiar spirit trying to say things that... Uh, but it's not God's plan for you. It's not God's will for you. Uh, and I wouldn't be taking any advice for something that's not of God. And, 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 but there's familiarities. You know, you can see um, that, that your children do that or, or your spouse. Like, uh, not that my wife and I ever fight. Uh, I don't want to give that presumption. I, I don't even want you. Know, we're pastors for crying out loud. Saved, sanctified. Filled with the Spirit, talking in tongues. <laughs> but if she wanted to, she would know what things that she could do that could make me go, 
from zero to 60 in a couple hours <laughs> or a couple seconds. We know, like, there's these certain things, and the enemy knows. And he's subtle. And he knows when to attack. Not when we're dripping from the waters of the Jordan, but when we haven't ate for 40 days. And he waits for those weak moments, like Monday morning. He waits for those weak moments when he tries to come in and he tries to attack. And when hell threw everything that he had, what would you think would be like Satan's secret weapon? How about his sword that he's sharpened, that he's wielding, that he's like ready as he jumps out from the bush in the wilderness, ready to take on Jesus? We would think of all these type of curses, incantations, but what does he do? If you are the Son of God, the enemy's greatest weapon against Jesus in that moment, against you and me and our life, is simply this. It's a question. Who would ever think that the enemy's greatest weapon is a question? That doesn't make sense. No, it's got to be a levitating of a bed or uh, candles being lit and a seance, a Ouija board, that's it. If we go around or, you know, like you would think there's all these supernatural things, but the most supernatural uh, uh, demonic attack that you and I will ever face doesn't come in a form of a man in a red uh, lycra suit with a pitchfork and a tail. He doesn't come at us in a way where he's going, you know what, I just come to make your day hell today. I'm just come, I'm, you know, I just come to beat you down today. No, it's not the way that it works because he's subtle and he waits for your weak moments. He knows what string to pull. You can be praying on your way to church until that blessed person gets in the fast lane and can't even go to the speed limit. He knows your buttons. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be that supernatural. He hasn't even talked to me very nice this morning. He hasn't even, you know, uh, you know look at that grouch. And on the other hand, you're thinking, I didn't even have my coffee yet this morning. Could you be a little quieter, please? We have these different things. How supernatural is that? Now, I think coffee's very uh, God sent. I think coffee is, yeah. I, I had two witnesses. Now, come on now. Thank you. That's why we have coffee out there, to help me out. So, when we're coming into this thing of dealing with the enemy, his greatest weapon always comes. And this is what he's doing. He's accusing both God and he's the, otherwise he's also accusing you. And, and so the temptation isn't as much as trying to turn stone into bread, but the temptation comes in the form of a question of actually questioning if what God said about you was true. And, and what I love so much about when we look into this portion of Scripture that... that when Jesus is battling the devil, that he doesn't get out uh, onto the water of a creek and the mountain and start walking on water. I'm glad that he wasn't doing anything miraculous at all to defeat the devil. Not a demon, not an imp, but the devil himself. And he didn't have to do any type of miracle. But the only thing he did was he brought the answer, it is written. Now wait a minute, I know there's spiritual warfare books out there, I know there's conferences out there, and I know there's times when we really are praying and we feel the umph and the power of God that we want to yell and scream at the devil, but that's not the greatest spiritual warfare. The greatest spiritual warfare is us being able to recognize that this isn't my own self that's thinking this in this moment. And this is a huge thing, because what he likes to do is he likes to imply a question. Did God really mean that you're going to change, that you can make an impact in somebody's life, that you can do what you're called to do? You call yourself a Christian. If you were really called to change the world, don't you think you can show up to church on a regular basis? <laughs> Oops, wait a minute. What I meant was... <laughs> We have the 
these, we have these different questions that form in our mind. And, and I'm telling you, I'm not speaking about this this morning because I read it in a book or listened to somebody else's sermon. That's not why I'm talking about this. I have tried to learn as best as I can. And the reality that I know firsthand on his attacks. This isn't something, everybody has different makeups, right? Maybe you're a person that your mind is going, like my wife. She's constantly thinking. And we, this is like something I beat all the time, I like to talk about this all the time. She's thinking all the time. Me, I'm not. <laughs> Sorry. She's thinking all the time, not so much me. Um, so, I'm not trying to give you a dirty look. Don't think I'm ignoring you. The thought just hasn't entered my mind yet. <laughs> if you see me in the foyer. And I'm looking over and yes, maybe looking at the donut. donut. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> but even in this type of scenario, I know so much in regards to I am one thought away from being paralyzed in my soul on a daily basis. And I've had to learn of the battles of the enemy of coming into a thought process that tries to make me to become stuck in maybe your past. Stuck in maybe of thinking, maybe it's not even your past, but how could your future get any better? Maybe it's, it's your future, well, where's the hope? And you thought you'd be further along than you are right now, and all these questions and accusations are coming to get you to a place where you feel like just being stuck in the routine of the day-to-day -day process. And if he can keep you bordered into this place of a routine life, because of these questions that come and roll through your mind. And if you're not careful, you think it's your thoughts. If you're not careful, you take credit for the thought that he, that he asked you. That's why he's called the accuser of the brethren. In, in the garden. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, it literally says he used the most subtle in the whole garden. That serpent was the most subtle in the whole garden. And that's what he used. Their imperfection, and still were able to fall by a question. Did God really mean that you would die if you ate of this? So these questions roll into our mind, and if we're not careful, we think it's our own thoughts. And anything that's accusing you of not being who God's called you to be, you didn't think that on your own. And anything accusing God of who he's not, who he said who he is, then that's the accuser of the brethren trying to come against this thing called the battlefield of the mind, his greatest arsenal to try to stop you from getting to what God has called you to be. And he doesn't mind if you go to church if you're miserable your whole life. And I'm not saying that you, you, know, you can enter into heaven, but I don't know about you, but I would personally like to smile on my way to heaven. I, that's just me. I'd like to smile on my way. And there's literally not a day where there's not something to where, the, I mean, from, from the morning, what do they say in Revelations? Day and night. And now we have this wrestling because here's how sneaky he is. Here's how disgusting he is. He puts the thought in your mind and then he accuses you for thinking it. <laughs> That's, you call yourself a Christian. Look at you. And you think you... He's the one to put the thought in your mind. And now he's going to try to beat you over the head because of it. The accuser of the brethren. And so... As we see that Jesus, here's the incredible thing, he didn't have to work miracles, signs, and wonders. And here's where the concept uh, separates people. Because they think 
uh, John chapter 8 says, it's the truth that sets you free. But that's not what the verse says. To walk in freedom, it's knowing the truth that sets you free. And this is two completely different things. In John 8, 31, and Jesus said unto the Jews, which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. There's a lot of people that will just think and buy into it's the truth that sets you free, but that's not, that's not the truth. It's the truth that you know that sets you free. So that when the enemy comes with a counterfeit question, that it's not able to make you believe it because you don't buy into the counterfeit when you know the genuine. Right? So because I know something that's genuine, even if your circumstance goes against everything that you quoted in Scripture, everything that you believe for, everything that you've prayed about, and your circumstances still deny it, what do you do? When those questions are coming into your mind and still bringing up these different scenarios, then what is enabling you to navigate through the enemy's flaming darts? Paul gives these descriptions. Matter of fact, when he speaks about it, it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now listen to this. The very first thing he lists in this is casting down imaginations. It's, he's depicting what the enemy uses through the thought processes to condemn us, make us feel condemned, or to make us feel like God's not living up to his end of the bargain. (laughs) And he's he's very subtle about it. He knows when you're tired. He knows when somebody's been a jerk to you and you have the right to be upset about it. He knows when you feel like you have the justification to feel the way that you do. He knows how to manipulate. I mean, matter of fact, he was even using Scripture when he was tempting Jesus. And something that went beyond turning bread into, uh, turning stone into bread was, are you really who God said you are? If you are the Son of God. Three times, if you are the Son of God. This is what he kept hinting at. If you are. And here's something that's so beautiful. Like we said, he wasn't working signs and wonders. He said, it is written. That doesn't sound too supernatural. But when you know what's written then you're able to combat the very ideas and thought processes that he invades your life with. And and when you know what is written, and and, and here's the amazing thing as well. See, we have the Old and New Testament. and We love uh, most of Paul's writings. We love all these different things. Jesus wasn't battling with the Old and New Testament. Jesus is battling, and he used three verses of Scripture. And three verses of Scripture from the Torah was able to defeat everything hell could throw at him. Come on, somebody. Come on. Three verses of Scripture. And you believe the lie that you had to have a master's degree in theology. Three verses to take the devil out. That's good news right there. Now, don't go getting lazy on me. But when the enemy comes in in these subtle ways, we have to begin to recognize and begin to bring this to the table. Now, when we're talking about spiritual warfare and these imaginations, there's a reason why Peter says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. We can see these different reasons for the, the reasons why Paul would say, I don't want you to be ignorant about it. And I love that Jesus was able to do it by it is written. Be sober, be vigilant. You know, there's so many times I've heard believers say, well, God said this to me. And they are actually believing God was speaking to them. And there's so many times it's through the filters of our personality. Like, like I know most of you all in here, right? Right? And so I know a lot of your personalities. And sometimes there's certain personalities, like if somebody's rough and gruff, guess what God speaks to them all the time? God says, I need to get my stuff in order. God told me, boy, he was really dealing with this on me. And and 
and that's and, I, and I'll, I'll sit there and I'll take a step back and I usually don't say anything. I'll just smile at you and bless God bless you, your heart, you know. But what we have to do is be careful because we'll have the filters of our personality even representing how as if maybe you didn't have a good father figure growing up and you allow that filter to be the filter in what you think God's character is or his personality. You follow what I'm saying? And, and so through the, going through the filters of our own perception, I, I had somebody just last week, no, 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 I didn't preach last week. Pastor Sandy tore the roof off the house last week. I, I was a couple weeks ago, and, you know, I, I delivered a message, and later on, someone came up to me and said, I just want to thank you, because as you spoke, this is what happened, and, and boom, 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 and I'm thinking, I didn't say that. <laughs> what do you mean? Wait a minute. I didn't say that. Are you kidding me? How could you get that out of what I said? And it wasn't a good thing. <laughs> I mean, there'd be other times I'd like to take credit. Yes, that was a great revelation, wasn't it? You know, was, thank you. No, I'll tell you this. If it's condemning and if it doesn't match up with the character of God, then you know that ain't God. <laughs> if God is not, now, is, there, is, is God going to correct? Yes. D does God correct? Yes, he does. But if all the time, all you're doing is getting these condemning words, you might want to stop and go, maybe that ain't all God. God will correct, but it brings you closer to him. God will correct, but it brings it love and, and, and like to a place where it stirs the passions of your heart, even in the correction. Let me tell you, you'll embrace the correction of God when you realize what it does. But being able to filter through our own personalities, being able to realize what's going on through these thoughts and these processes. And the, uh, so when Monday is on the way, guys, <laughs> I'm trying to prepare you to let you know. When you wake up on a Monday and you, you're not feeling like it's the best day, the best week, you've got to be able to take a step back and go, no, that's not the way that I'm going to think. And God does have a future for me. And I am going to change somebody's life. And just for that... I'm going to make sure of it, and I love it. Like when I find, that's one of the things I love about going to the nations. When the enemy attacks, that, that, that's when it's on. I mean, you know, don't just sit there like this. You know, if you get attacked, get up and hit back, man. If you get up, get some blood on that sword. Go back in, love somebody, lead somebody to Jesus. And I always try to say, I've always tried, I can remember, uh, that, that's just one of my things, my, my foothold. Uh, enemy... If you think I'm just going to take this sulking, you've got another thing coming. I'm going to make you wish you left me alone and maybe I would have been comfortable. But now you've just made me mad. Now you just made me mad. Now you just made me mad. I shared this one time in my first closing as the worship team comes this morning. I shared this one time. I can remember watching this uh, on TV where they were doing these animal rescues. And there was this uh, deer that had fallen into the, uh, in, into the lake, but it was iced over, but in this certain spot. And this deer had uh, tried getting out on its own for so long, it actually had gotten weak. It had no more strength to get out on its own. And as bystanders were watching, they did some things that weren't too wise, but they went to help this deer. And as they're sitting there and they're doing this, um, they couldn't get it, and they, it, it got to this last-ditch effort, and this guy is sitting there, and he begins to slap the deer in the face. And, and at your first reaction is, what a cruel guy. Or, Look at that jerk. Or, you know, all the, who knows what, maybe if you saw that, he, uh, if you're doing it. But one thing that it did was it awakened and angered this animal into such a way that it gave it a little bit more than it had before. And it began to actually give it enough to get to the point where it got out of the water and ran off into the woods. I guess what I'm trying to say is, when he hits you, do not just stay in the hole. Don't just stay thinking that you have, you may feel weak with no strength, but I'm telling you, when he hits you, hit back. Get up and say, I dare you mess with the child of God. You're going to try to depress me another day. I'm going to try to help somebody else with depression in your 
face. You're going to try to make me and uh, ruin my week? Then I'm going to try to reach out to somebody. Make a phone call. Actually send a good message on Facebook. Or, you know, do something to impact somebody's life. That needs to be the category and the way that we handle an attack. And when you find yourself in a place, if you're depressed, you know that your thoughts are not in line with God's thoughts. And so you had to begin to change your thoughts. I love it. I don't remember if it was Graham or Bill, but it said, you know, if you're having a bad thought, as it was Graham, have another thought. Have another thought. I've, I'm in the process of training to the best of my ability to have another thought, to place in a different thought. When imaginations and images flash before my eyes, I place another image there. I place the image, I place the image that Kim Clement had mentioned to me. I place an image of one with a different set of eyes. And I replace the image, and I have another thought. And it's time to recognize that the accuser of the brethren is making his last accusations of hitting home and hitting to the heart. We come to this place. Come on, somebody. Of changing our thoughts in line with God's thoughts. And if he tries to make you think, and what Jesus did, I get it, you're trying to stand up to shut me up, but it ain't going to work. He tries to bring these thoughts into your mind to derail you, detour you. But what I love about Jesus is he went into the wilderness and he was filled with the Spirit of God. But it says that when he came out, that he came out in power. Completely different things went in filled by the Spirit of God. But as he overcame the enemy's thought processes, his temptations, and his, his attacks, he came out empowered with a power he did not have before he walked into the wilderness. If you find yourself in a wilderness day, a wilderness week, look to the bright future, that there's some power coming into your life as a result of this attack. Look to the future of saying, just as Jesus walked through the hell of the temptation and came out empowered. God, I thank you for a power that I did not have before I walked through this. Some power. Power to love like you've never loved. Power to walk like you've never walked. Power. Power to make him wish he didn't attack you. Power to make him wish. And Father, I just thank you for the recognizing of the voice of the accuser of the brethren beyond our filters, beyond the accusations that we're able to stand and look in alignment, oh God. I thank you for the stirring of knowing your word, of knowing your heart, to be able to know in Jesus' name. And when the devil asked him, Jesus didn't say, well, devil, don't you know I was just baptized and, and like the Spirit of God descended on me and there was a voice from heaven that God said I was a beloved son. He didn't say that. Why? He did not use his experience to define the battle with his enemy. So I don't know what your experience is. Even if your experience goes against what you believe, then I don't even go by my experience, but I go by it is written. Because it's not the truth that sets you free, but it's knowing the truth that sets you free. God, I thank you for the release, oh God, of a heart to know your truth, to know your wisdom, to know you. God, I thank you for the silencing 
of the accuser of the brethren over Gateway this morning. God, to recognizing, sensitive, to recognize the accuser's voice. And I thank you for a people that are walking in freedom, a people that are walking in truth. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen. If you're here this morning, you have any prayer requests, maybe you need healing in your body, you want to make a fresh surrender to Jesus, these altars are open. We just invite you right now to step out of your seats. You can make your way up here to the front. And the pastors and the ministry team, we're going to, be, we're going to see heaven moving on your behalf. So if you're here right now and you need prayer for anything, just step out of your seats. Make your way up to the front. We're going to worship with this song and uh, have an incredible afternoon. And we'll see you tonight.